Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, well, good. I think it is. Well, you get part of the story. The book, the the article, but it's pre copy edited is on the Philsi archive. Oh, is it already up? Yeah. Uh, September, maybe yeah. August, maybe? Oh, okay. maybe September. I can't remember. We're in copy editing right now, so um, I got to get it up before it's. I have to. I can only post the the uncopy edited version, and until it's out, and it's they're doing it. They're fast tracking this coming out in February. It's a book. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, oh, we got it in in August and it's coming out in Oxford. Yeah, I think because of what it is and because of other things that are coming out. Yeah. So. But I'm going to tell a different part of this story than I've been telling. So. Wait for them to come in. Is there? Can I get some water? Is that possible? Can John get me coffee? Very good. Oh, tap water? No, I don't want tap water from fish. Thank you. <laughs> I've heard the stories. Ask Mike Dietrich. <laughs> oh, there's no water? Isn't there water outside in the thing? If it came from the tap, no. Oh, the filter is good. John, you should have Mike tell you the stories about the of what comes out of the taps on the pig canvas. You wouldn't drink the water either. Uh, well, honestly, it's too late. <laughs> that explains a lot. I've been here, but I've been here for 40 years now. And, um, and, oh, That's, it's that color. <laughs> it's that color. <laughs> I, I explain why you should. Yeah, yeah. No, but. Sorry, he just told the story last week, so I'm completely. <laughs> okay, guys, we want to get we want to get started. Um, will the will the wolves surrounding the carrion out there hurry up? Come on, no need to be polite. Everybody, you wait and grab the food. Come on, <coughs> I tried. Um, you may start. Okay, right. okay so uh, by the way, uh, is the very happy one of introducing today's speaker. It's David Wallace. He's going to give my talk. <laughs> uh, Sandy Mitchell now. Uh, is involved with this, uh, I'm guessing you all really know who she is. Or perhaps there are some people here who are sitting there wondering, who the heck is this woman who's sitting up, up the front is going to give us a talk? I am going to address you because uh, you will now know uh, who she is. Sandy Mitchell uh, works in general philosophy of science and methodology of science. She works in philosophy of biology uh, and uh, especially on issues of complexity. Uh, she has contributed many important and valuable works to the field. Uh, I'll mention some of them because we don't have that much time. Uh, she wrote a book, uh, Biological Complexity and Integrative Pluralism. Came out with Cambridge University Press 
and Unsimple Truths, Science, Complexity, and Policy with the University of Chicago Press. And if you would like to read that in German, um, it's there. There's a translation. And you can, you can get it. I think it sounds better in German. It's Say it in German. It's great. I fought them on the title, but I've lost. Complexität, warum wir erst anfangen, die Welt zu verstehen. That rolls yeah. right yeah. off the tongue. Yeah. And you know, people <laughs> disagree with that. <laughs> Oh, yeah, lots now, of um, it's also written many papers <laughs> to you. Uh, uh, what I especially value is that Sandy has been an enormous support for the uh, uh, for in, in service to our profession. She's done so many things that are wonderful. Let me tell you a few of them. She was chair of the Department of HPS from 2005 to 2018. Uh, that is a form of exquisite punishment that I don't think anyone should be forced to bear, but somehow uh, she managed and, uh, and did a remarkably good job of it. Uh, we need to thank her for the health of the, of the department. Uh, the department cannot thrive without a very good and effective chair, so thank you for that. Uh, she was president of the PSA from 2016 to 2018. Uh, another job that, if done well, benefits us all, and, and it was done well. Um, she is a fellow of the American Association of the Advancement of Science, uh, and she has uh, received uh, let's see, um, many, many awards. I have a medal. I know. Yes, I was <laughs> you that. Yeah, yeah now let, let, let's, let's get to the talk. <laughs> I got a medal only because I was around. Nick uh, and Adolf for so long. Here's the medal. Uh, she, she received <laughs> in 2014 the medal of the Universita Campus Biomedico di Roma. And as you can see, she does not wear it. Um, why do you think they gave it to you <laughs> and you don't wear it? I mean, what, what was the point? And finally, uh, uh, she is a distinguished professor here at University of Pittsburgh, and she will speak to us on this topic. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, this is really, I'm really happy to talk about this today. I'm gonna try to get to, this is the fruit of a newish project that's come out of a, a lot of things I've worked on over the years. I will situate it both in my own work and then in uh, the context of some views about the metaphysics of science to suggest why this approach I'm developing um, is, one you should adopt. I mean, if you're a rational agent, but I mean, you know, <laughs> what can I say? Um, so um, this uh, this is a chapter in a book co-edited with by Holly Anderson and myself that will come out in February. It's currently co in copy editing mode, um, and and cover art arrived this morning so we're in we're close um it's a, i just want to say and jim jim has a, a chapter in it and jim knows this uh this uh project very well because it came out of a series of workshops that we um produced over several years on what i wanted to call pragmatist metaphysics but nobody else liked that name at the time when we initiated the workshop I was hoping we'd have a prolegomena for the pragmatist metaphysics, uh, but uh, a manifesto for it. And if that failed on that first meeting, we'd have a prolegomena for a future manifesto on that subject. And that failed. And so the third option is we'd have more workshops, which we did. <laughs> and the fruit of this, in part, is this edited volume um, that I, I think is going to be a, an interesting um, uh, Con contribution. It is called the pragmatist challenge. You can fill in the blank of what it's a challenge to. Um, if you need help, let me just say analytic metaphysics yeah. under my breath. Okay. So it's supposed to be an alternative framework in which to engage with what are typically metaphysical questions about truth. And, and I'm talking about realism and, and Ned Hall's talking about laws. And, and there's, and so there's, it's it's supposed to, through the work of a bunch of different people, um, show what kinds of approaches a pragmatist can take to these kinds of topics. So that's what it, this is in the service of. And if you want to read an um, uncopy edited version of the paper, it's up on Phil's site archives. I'm only giving part of it today because all you can do. Okay, so here's a, an outline of what I want to do. I'm going to talk about the kind of my background assumptions and strategies that have 
situated this particular project in my work. Um, I'm going to talk about what uh, Chakrabarty has called the bottom up versus top down inferences to the reality of phenomenon. Um, I'm going to suggest why the dichotomy fails by appealing to one of my culture heroes, namely Duem. But maybe a picture of Duem that you are not as familiar with with respect to underdetermination than the logical analysis about the need for auxiliary hypothesis. Okay, so it's going to be a different kind of argument about semantic underdetermination. I'm going to suggest a third way, and this is this interactionism affordances picture of how. Uh, scientists um, establish provisionally uh, 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 and are justified in establishing positing a phenomenon as real. And then I'm going to conclude, and I have one little example. I usually switch this and don't do the background and do most of the example, but I'm doing the background this time. See what you guys think. Okay, so here's the, here's the inside of my brain. This is what um, the kinds of things I've been thinking about over the last in years. Um, namely, you can't see that because there's a picture of me at the top. I don't know how to get rid of that. Um, hmm? You should be able to minimize that. Yeah, but I don't have that oh, so. screen, so I don't know how to do it. Uh, I don't know how to do it. Anyway, um, so for me, I've been defending these views about uh, pluralism and more recently perspectivism in science that move between these three context of looking at the issues, namely between ontological questions, you can call them metaphysical questions, epistemological questions, and the scientific practices. As a pragmatist, since taking a pragmatist stance um, towards the practices and products of science shapes our answers to these epistemological and ontological questions, and they all interact with each other, right? You, have, you need to understand what the ontology is, you have to look at the practices, to understand what the practices should be, you have to understand the epistemology and so forth. Okay, so I live in this, in this geographical space, which has led me to the critical pieces of the picture are that um, um, I, I think science is, one of the constitutive assumptions of science is a compositional materialism or physicalism, but in, in the, the epistemological reflection of that is uh, is through the lens of the kinds of representational model scientists or any human being or anybody could do, which are always partial. And by being partial, namely, you don't, it's a rejection of some forms of completeness in non-formal systems that, that in, in light of their being partial, leaving, thing out, leaving things out, the flip side is their perspectival, namely encoded what's left in either intentionally or as a function of the kind of representational medium you're using will allow certain things to be represented and other things not. So what do we expect when, when science is, is looking at you know, the materialist nature of, wor of the world, um, through its partial perspectival representations as we expect the practices and products of science to show these islands of local unifications, but having and moments of partial rejection, but primarily an ongoing and enduring pluralism. And that's kind of been what my, the, I've done for many years. Um, most recently, I, because of my collaboration with Angela uh, Gronenborn, who's a structural biologist, I've been, I've turned my attention much more to the kinds of experimental practices in science and uh, to look at the that piece of the story, namely that real phenomena have causal effects, right? And causal effects are the kinds of things that are engaged with in experimental and observational contexts. We, ever since at least the 17th century, another constitutive assumption of, of uh, science has been that it is empirical, that the empirical, uh, the empirical access to the phenomena is supposed to be the arbiter of our, theoretic, our theories about the phenomenon and not the other way around. Right? And so, uh, and, and the models of these uh, phenomena, either experimental models, data models, representational models, whatever, are more or less accurate um, in the sense that they accommodate or the accepted empirical data, right? And they are more or less adequate, which is how they serve at, um, our pragmatic goals. So given that you have multiple models on this pluralist 
few, you can judge them with respect to ac accuracy, which is one of the uh, constitutive norms of science, but you can also judge them with respect to adequacy since there's no one model that can do everything anti-completeness here again. Okay, so what you get is the persistence of model experimental and explanatory pluralism in the practice side. Now, what we're going to talk about today is this cool new thing, right, new-ish thing, which is what I think it is to be real, right, which I'm going to defend a view of Gibsonian affordances, which will come in a little bit, and to suggest that what it is to be real, the epistemology on this picture, is one where real reference is co-constructed by the interaction of frameworks, theories, and experience. Right? Um, this is when we talk about some, and that what you what the practice reflection of that epistemology and ontology is an ongoing iterative integration in crafting a coherent network of beliefs. And that's what I think goes on in science. Okay, that's what happens. And here's my picture of it. Well, here's a prettier, a cooler picture of it. What's, what's the data? What, what phenomena are real? Okay. What is the justification for claiming something is real? Um, what, and what I will, will address that question in this form. What warrants a scientific claim that X is real? Okay. What's the justification? What's the methodology and justification for claiming something is real? It's a little different than saying what's really real if you, you know, appealing to some theological other access. I don't have any of that. I don't, you know, all, we, all I got is data experiments and, and brains making up models and testing them. Right, that's the world I live in, and for that, the the claim about re what's real is what warrants a claim of realism. There's lots of different other sources of warrant that um, I've written about. What we're going to talk about them. Okay, so here's the story, um, or here's my here's the conclusion because you might as well know where I'm going before I start going, which is um, um, the conclusion is that within a perspective, right, that consists of goals, actions, and questions, what we say there is and what we say it does, right, is justified by the ongoing interactions among representation, represent, representative models, causal experience and experiment, and the conceptual frameworks that are, are designed, that, that you, you're just warned in saying it's real when you reach a fallible convergence to what is real. All of those contribute to how you establish the reality of some phenomenon. Um, I, uh, I defend this as an interactionist pragmatist account, which is in contrast to what you I identify and others have as fundamentalist representationalist approaches to what constitute the realism of scientific theories and models. Fundamentalism about realism has been attached to two strategies, this top-down strategy and a bottom-up strategy. And what I'm gonna offer is a non-dichotomous alternative. Um, what we are justifying claiming is real phenomena are the affordances constructed from the integration of top-down and bottom-up strategies. And I will illustrate this in the end with a little bit of an example. Okay, so uh, Chakravarti and others have identified these two major, if you look at the philosophy of science, how do people, what are the, what's out there in terms of warrant for claims of realism? And um, he suggests that there are two major strategies, a bottom-up strategy, namely that causation is thought to be the foundation of justifying what is real, that real phenomena are the things that are that cause our experiences, right? And that generate data in different types of experiments, right? So what's real is what's causally at the other end of the experimental practices, right? And that from looking at it, and especially things like um, convergence of diff multiple experiments, think Perrin and his 13 ways of measuring Avogadro's number, right? These, which is the thing, I, it's another paper, but I'm not going to give it, which is the thing that made Wes Salmon become a realist, right? Okay, so this is supposed, you know, this convergence of multiple um, experimental results is what made him, a, he claims, made him a, a realist. And so those kinds of bottom up from the experiment, the results of multiple experiments, that's what gives you grounds for positing what's real. We infer the real phenomena on the bottom up case from reliable convergent data. Okay. 
All right. And you can see this. I'm not going to elaborate this here, but you can see this in the philosophical accounts of people like Nancy Cartwright or, or hacking that are called themselves entity realisms. I can tell you there's an entity there. Can't tell you much about it, but you know, that's a thin, I can give you a thin description of a robustly real thing, right? Through this kind of bottom-up approach. I can tell you there's something there. There must be something there that's causing all of these different kinds of effects in my experience and experiments. Okay. The top-down one typically associated with people who do uh, more philosophy of um, mathematically uh, uh, rep mathematically heavy representational sciences, because it works better when you have a mathematical structure. It's a structural realist account. Um, nobody, I don't think anybody holds the literalist account that everything I say in my theory is must be real. I don't think anybody holds that view anymore. So these are the more plausible ones. The structural realist account is that structural relations are the foundation of what is real, that real phenomena are isomorphic, isomorphic to the mathematical relations in our best theories, right? Or similar in some spe specific way. I mean, there's a big debate on what that relationship is of the representation. We read it from the, we, we infer the real phenomena from the best confirmed theories we have. We read them off the theories of what those structures are, they, we can read them off those structures because they're the best confirmed ones, right, that we have. And that's a kind of top-down account of what warrants a claim of realism. Now, my suggestion is let's break this dichotomy. It's always, I'm going to argue, both. It's always both. You can't do a top-down warrant without engaging directly with the causal understanding of uh, warrant from experimental work, unless, I mean, I, I always make this caveat, is string theory still alive? Can I stop making this caveat? I, I have to still make the caveat? Okay. Except for things like string theory, which I don't understand, so don't ask me. Okay. So, but um, in everything else, <laughs> you need to have the mute, not just both warrants, right? And I'll talk about that in a second, but both warrants in a very iterative, integrative way. Um, so that's the that's the strategy, um, and where does this all come from? So here, let me give you the kind of why where this view has its philosophical legacy, um, and that is you know the relationship between theories and data, theories and observation is what you have to navigate if you want to have a theory that you think is. I don't know, true, or that what it refers to as real in a science that is normatively empiricist. Okay, so you have to, and it's always been the case. So there's there's a logical account, which I won't go into because you all know this so well, right? About how we represent the relationship between the import of the experimental to the theoretical in terms of these simple logical relationships that were shown early on to be inadequate to capture either the reasoning or the practice of science, right? So if, if H is true, then if C is true, then E is true. Just think of the logical empiricist. Um, and we know that, um, that the relationship between what is observed, you know, you observe C and E or you observe C and not E, neither of them is, is going to give you warrant for what is claimed in the H because of the problem of alternative hypothesis, confirmations not de deductive, right? And the uh, problem of auxiliary hypothesis refutation is not specific. So the underdetermination, this is read just as the underdetermination of the theories by the by um, observational evidence or data is can be reflected in this logical relationship, right? However, that turns out to be a really thin description of what's going on, right? There's a lot going on in the practices of science, both inferentially and um, in terms of what the the activities are around generating experiment experimental data. Okay, the data. Okay, that's a, like just say the data to anybody who's an experimentalist. It's like what, what, which data, when data, what, you know, what level of data, what sta stage of data, wh whose data, right? Um, and so uh, over time, things got more 
developed in terms of an analysis of what the relationship is between the theoretical claims about what's real and the experimental claims about what, what the real things were doing in an experiment. And you get Suppy's multiple theories. He, he gave a decomp, if you like, a further thicker description in terms of the decompens, de, what do I want to say? Decomp, not, I would say decompensation sounds like a, like a psychiatric disorder. Is that what decomposition? That's what we want. The decomposition of the steps that generate data, right? And then their relationship to theory. So this is this is actually Karen um, Darling's more uh, graphical account of what's in his early paper on on uh, on data. So you have um, actual theoretic actual setup of experiments is going to have some theory of the of experimental design involved in generating what kind of experimental setup. You have to have a theory of the data that gives you the ways in which you can correct the output so that you can get to something that you think is data that can serve as evidence, right? Not everything that's generated in a in a lab turns out to be accepted as reliably um, re reflecting um, the source, namely the phenomenon that you're causally engaged with. All right, you with me here? You got You got to call. You have a phenomenon. The, this is the causal. There's a causal story, and then there's the inferential story. But there's lots of inferences in the causal story, right? That have appeal to according to to um, Suppies. There's theories at every stage of this story, right? Of how you get data that can then be evidence for testing some physical theory, right? Um, but the physical theory from it, you have to generate some theory of the experiment. If this physical theory uh, is correct, what should I see if I go and, you know, if, if Newton's theory is correct, what should happen in a spring? What should happen in a pendulum? What should happen in a falling body, right? You have to give an interpretation of some form that takes those formal structural mathematical relationships and give and tells you what you should see in different contexts. Okay, so you have a theory of the experiment that will exhibit to you what your uh, abstract theory, right, is is positing, right. And if you have two of them, that's good because then you can say, well, let's see. They posit, they say they have two different theories. They say I should see different things. I go out and look. This is the old story. Right. But there's a lot going into actually doing all of those steps. Then you get all the possible data sets. This is, again, the kind of Suppy's way of doing it. He wanted to develop formal um, uh, ways of uh, representing the statistical relationships between all of the, di the different steps as well. Um, and you look at the canonical data. I think what is mean is the, the cleaned up, what's established, uh, accepted as reliable, judged to be reliable data. And you see what their relationship is in that. What is that egg-shaped thing doing? Okay. okay. So the question for me is, what, do, what is that egg-shaped thing doing? Okay. How do they, how do, how do you put them in the same, in the same egg? Okay. All right. Um, and we have, so we have this kind of deep, you know, many, many theories, many, many steps. Um, and Geary has a different represent account. Both of both Suppies and Geary were uh, took a semantic view of theory, so um, it's in terms of models, um, which are formal structures, and their inter their representational uh, relatives. Okay, that you get from trying to interpret them for different contexts. So for him, now here's Geary's hierarchy of the world. That's always good. It's good when you. Actually, you're going to investigate the world, experiments and data on the bottom, right? His is strict, a stricter hierarchy. You have principled models at the top, right? The formal mathematical function of uh, F equals MA. I like simple ones because, you know, I do. I don't do simple science. I do other things, but I don't want to, but these typically are done in, in physical theory. And certainly since Duem is working on physical theory, why not do that? Gary went, did a lot of that. From the principal models, you have the representation models from the physical theory. You all, you can't just say, what is this function going to do? You have to put, uh, you have to interpret it. Then you have that will generate specific hypotheses and generalizations. From the bottom, you get models of experiments and data, and they suggest these two things at the bottom. And uh, I don't know what those arrows are doing either. And Gary does 
make explicit that these arrows in his hierarchy are not necessarily logical inferences. So what are they? How do you do it? Okay. How do you get, how do they meet in the middle? How do the, what is going on in that day? What is the, what is it that you do when you try to bring together um, the theory and experiment when it's no longer a simple account of logical inference anymore? Now there's other things happening. Okay, at least it's complex inference, right? But it's also complex inference and actual activities in a laboratory, causal interactions. So it's not even just inferences. Um, okay, so let's go to my culture hero. Okay, so Duem famously showed why you had, why there was underdetermination uh, logically of a hypothesis by any experimental data. He showed why you can't have crucial experiments. So he's blocking the move that the data is gonna determine, um, under, it under determines what a theory we should accept. Instead, but in addition, what he does is a second form of underdetermination. Karen Darling has written about this. I think it's a really important feature of underdetermination that isn't as well known. Um, we call, I'm, she calls it, and I'll call it a semantic underdetermination. Namely, you have a causal story and an epistemic story, right? An inferential story from the theory trying to say what you should see, and a causal story from the actual interactions to a representation of what you did see, right? Okay. So you have cause, uh, this causal frame and you have this, uh, this is bottom up and top down, just named differently, okay? So the causal stories you observe, intervene, manipulate to determine the facts in an experiment, the data, right, that you're gonna accept. And the epistemic story is that you infer from the observed facts that serve as evidence for or against a, a, a theory. You want them to speak to the theory. I guess it's not top down, bottom up. So here's the thing. Um, what Duem says, this has been an important thing for me to figure out, is he says the same theoretical fact, right? If we go back the slide, the theoretical fact, what the theory says you should see, the same theoretical fact may correspond to an infinity of distinct practical facts. What you can tell me I saw in the practice of the experiment. The same practical fact may correspond to an infinity of logically incompatible theoretical facts, okay? So the problem is, how do you translate what you observe in the laboratory into what the theory said you should expect to see? And one of his, one of he says in the Amen structure, traditori, traditori, to translate is to betray. Now, what he means by this is that there are judgments that aren't that aren't driven by logic, right? That are have to be made all through this process. But importantly, the argument is this, and here's some cute pictures to make you happy about my argument, right? Is that he thinks there's three different kinds of facts, right? There's the theoretical facts. So my theory says, you know, the relationship between force and mass is this, right? Okay. My mathematical facts are just the formal facts about the, the mathematical representation that I'm using to say something about physical theory, which is about the world, okay? okay. And then I have my, my practical facts, which are what, you don't need to know these theories to do to be an experimentalist, right? You can just try, we, you don't need to do, know them to do the experiment, you need to know them to interpret the experiment, right? So for example, if you have measurements of, uh, uh, of the electromotive force, and John is gonna explain this if you have any questions about this. Okay, if you have measurements of the electromotive force, he likes these kinds of examples. And here's your different measurements. They're you know, 0 0.844, 0 0.845, 0 0.846, right? And you have a theoretical fact about what you should predict to measure in, the, in, a, in a given experiment, right? Then it turns out that, so if we, if see, if, we increase the pressure by 100 atmosphere, blah, blah, blah. I'd set up an account where this is what I should expect to see. And it turns out that if in, in, in that, and, and the way Duem describes it is that theoretical facts are always more precise than practical facts, right? 
and that mathematical facts are not identical to theoretical facts. So the, the issue is that if you're predicting I should see 0.845 volts and my experimental practical facts I can't discriminate except to the 0.08 level, then I don't know whether I should take that as confirming or disconfirming my hypothesis since it is consistent with my practical facts that what I've measured is anywhere between 0 0.8080 and 0 0.89899, right? Okay. And those are very different claims, right? They're certainly not mathematically equivalent. So we know the mathematician says they're not the same thing, right? Okay. The, the experimenter says, this is what I got. Right? And the theoretician has to decide whether to treat them as confirming or not confirming. They have to, that's a judgment that's made, right? It's not demanded by either the theory or the experimentation. Um, so important to remember that for Duema physical theory is expressed in mathematics in symbolic abstract language, but it's not the same as pure mathematics, right? And it's not the same as the reports of experience. Language of experiment, meter readings for the theoretician, symbolic relationships for the math mathematician, these numbers are contradictory. And the theoretical physicist has to treat all three in one measurement. They have to decide, they have to make a judgment. Okay, so judgments about this are about translation, but translation is betrayal, right? So. How, on what basis is this translation made? On what basis does the, um, does the, does some data count as evidence for or against theory? So what I wanna suggest is that Duem goes into this kind of, this is another form of Duemian holism, if you like. He has a logical underdetermination argument, which you all know, right? But there's also this semantic gap right, that it cannot be exact equivalence between a practical fact and a theoretical fact. Experiments don't give unique numerical values, physical theory, et cetera, it's what I just said here. And so how we determine whether or not I have evidence for or against something is not dictated by the evidence or the theory. There's some other judgment that's required. And it's in that space that I think pragmatism enters. Right. What differences will make a difference to the practices um, that scientists engage in? When do we decide something's real? Right. When do I decide that I have a real thing at the end of my experiment? When do I decide that my, what my theory says captures what's re a real phenomenon? So what I'm going to suggest is a different way forward. OK, Duem points out the problem, right? Geary points out the problem, Sapis points out the problem, you need all this stuff and then there's an egg, you know, and you have to figure out what, well, how, but how do you move forward from this? And what I'm gonna suggest is a pragmatist metaphysics that goes beyond just identifying the holism or the, or the reticulated, complicated, multiple presence of theories in the process of doing experiments and inferring from experiments. So in a pragmatist approach, what do I mean by that? Okay, so this is one of the things this book is trying to do. Um, notice it's not pragmatic. There's a difference between being a pragmatist and just saying it's pragmatic. Pragmatic's about means ends reasoning. Pragmatic, I, it's pragmatic to do X if I want Y. But the pragmatist suggests that uh, the roles, wants to look at the roles of agency and judgment play in inferential and experimental practices that support claims about nature, right? That it's more about how do I judge what's real is a function of the agency and judgments of human contributions to this uh, warranty, right? Let's just call it that. What we are justified in claiming is real phenomena, or I'm gonna claim are the affordances constructed from the integration of top-down and bottom-up strategies, okay? So I need help on this. I'm gonna tell you what I got so far, okay? Within a perspective consisting of goals, action, questions, we, what we say in this, I read this already out, there is and what we say it does is justified not by some similarity, some isomorphism, I'm done, right? Representationalist view. This says that it's like this, I look at them, right? 
what I've tried to suggest from the Duemian argument, they're no looking at them, right? There's judging about them, right? About whether or not what the theory says and what the experimental practice delivers are in, in um, agreement or not and when, and the kinds of things that go into that judgment, I won't hopefully get to. So what I wanna suggest is this. So this is this affordance interactionist approach rather than a, a representationalist approach or a logical approach. It's a different way to answer the question. Real phenomena are sufficiently stable to afford detection and representation. Now, this is a view that, it, what, which I think is pluralist, perspectival, and pragmatist. I think it's also top at the same time top down and bottom up, right? So you can't just do one of those. And I'm getting, I, I think it's analogous to something that J.J. Gibson, who was an ecological psychologist, suggested. And he said, affordances are properties taken with reference to the observer. And I wanna use that kind of framing in the next slide. But what he said is, and this is too small to read, the affordances of the environment are what it offers the animal, what it provides or furnishes, either for good or ill, right? The verb to afford is found in the dictionary, but the noun affordance is not. I, J.J. Gibson, have made it up in 1979. I mean by it something that refers to both the environment and the animal in a way that no existing term does. It implies the complementarity of the animal and the environment. And there's more he says about it if you want to have, um, but I think I want to not take up too much more time here. Um, some other things he says about it, I think, are also illuminating because he says the affordance of the, um, he says, um, affordances for Gibson are real objective properties of the environment plus organism, right? Not in the environment, not in the organism. It's in that combination of the environment and the organism. For example, he says, to be graspable, an object must have opposite surfaces separated by a distance less than the span of a hand. Okay, right? The affordance is not out there for the organism to engage like a dispositional categorical property. Rather, it is constructed by the engagement of the organism with their environment. Okay. Um, and he says, um, they are in a sense objective, real and physical, unlike values and meanings, which are often supposed to be subjective, phenomenal and mental, but actually in affordance, this is Gibson, is neither an objective property nor a subjective property, or it's both, if you like. An affordance cuts across the dichotomy of subjective objective and helps us understand its inadequacy. So how do I, I use this in this context? I wanna say, Affordances are properties, entities, or structures that are taken with reference to a theoretical and conceptual framework. Okay, uh, that's the, the the scientific framework is the organ the organism that is engaging with the, what the properties and entities and structures are given by experiment and theories. The affordances of real phenomena are what they offer the scientists, what they provide or furnish to experiment and representation. You need both, right? I mean by it something that refers to both the causal properties in nature and the representational framework of the scientist. It implies the complementarity of both in establishing what is real. So this is going an argument from complementarity that what it, it, it you can't have something isn't real if we it's real it's a real let's see what's a good case uh, well it's a real it's the real structure of a protein so this example I'm going to put up on the next slide it's a real structure of the protein if the data that's generated from the experimental detection of the atomic relationships in a protein, either through X-ray crystallography or nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, which have been, and we can go through, that's a long story of how you get to what that data model is, right? And it's never a unique model. It's the, here's the range of models that are, sat, that's the, satisfied the data that I've now cleaned up and think is reliable detection of the signal of the protein analog 
that I'm engaging with in order to know what the actual protein does. Okay, looks like what its structure is. Okay, there's a complicated story. Think of Suppy's model, right? And in that, at the end of that compl complicated story, I give you a, a, a data model, a model from the data, namely all of the models, the, the structural models of the protein that are consistent with the data I've now decided is reliable data. Um, and in the end, um, I forgot where I started this because I went through, two th okay, so, but it has to be represented, right, in a way that makes contact with the theoretical description of what the protein structure would be, right? And I can make predictions about the protein, what the protein structure should be. Those are ab initio models. Don't look at the experiment, right? I can do it experimentally. I got an x-ray, I got cryo-EN, I got all sorts of experimental ways of detecting what the protein structure is. I have theories of the protein structure. They're usually molecular dynamics. There are now quantum mechanical models too, but they, they are they're thermo, basically thermodynamic models that predict, predict that the structure, the atomic level structure of a protein will be the one with the least mean gives energy. It's the most stable thermodynamically, blah, blah, blah. Top down, bottom up. Okay. And then it, but it turns out that actually the most successful modeling, although talk to me in three weeks, because I'm about to try to answer the question about whether DeepMind is any better in what it's doing, but I, there's AlphaFold and RosettaFold now. So there's a whole new player on the block. But right now, before I figure that out, this is the case. The case is that the most successful predictors, right? The most models predicting the structure of a protein are semi-empirical ones. Namely, there's ones that engage in this actual interaction between the data and the theory and the data and the theory and the data. And, and they do these tests every four years. They're called the CAST test. They do tests every four years to test different ab initio models, these um, homological models, right? Um, with what is detected experimentally, right? Okay, to determine who, doing what we think this relationship is between experiment and theory, right? And it turns out that <clears throat> the ab initio ones aren't very good, the ones that are strictly ab initio, but these ones which are comparative protein structure modeling, read that as hom homological modeling, are the most successful prior to Deep mind. They are ones where you have a target sequence of amino acids that defines a protein, right? And you want to know what is functional three-dimensional structure is. What you do is you look at all the things we already have detected and see whether where there's sequence analogs, how many, how many proteins that we've already detected experimentally with this sequence piece have this structure piece. Well, if it's really high, then if I have the sequence piece. I'm going to assume I have the same structure piece. And that will, in, in fact, what it does is it, it greatly restricts the um, search space for what's the best confirmation thermodynamic model. What's the least, I mean, because it's nearly an NPP hard problem the confirmation space is so great that how you figure out ab initio from your model, which one it's going to be, has problems, sampling problems. You have to sample enough to be close to in this incredible space. So if you can limit the space, you have better ways of using the top-down theoretical prediction, right? Okay, so this is one way of limiting the space, right? But it has problems, right? So you do all this, and this has all been automated now. You can just buy a program on, online and do this. Um, you deal with known structures and templates. You have your target sequence. You decide, well, it's gonna be like this because of the ones I've known directly using data to construct the model rather than using data to test the model. Um, and you do, um, Anyway, the four main steps are uh, 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 find the right template from existing data, target template alignment, see how much it aligns with your target uh, one, build your model, and then you have to evaluate your model. Now, some of the ways in which judgment comes in is that expected conformational diversity impairs the well-established correlation between sequence and structural divergence. So in certain domains, right? Everything with these sequences has the same structure. In other domains, other kinds of proteins, everything with this sequence has a whole huge, a lot, a bunch of different structures, right? 
Okay, so you can't always do this. You have to make a judgment about um, whether that diversity of structure, the lack of correlation is due to noise, right? Or something else. If it's noise, that means that actually the signal is coherent, right? And the diversity is, is uh, either random or systemic, right? To the experimental protocol, not to the thing. The noise can be resolved on, this is from some recent work, using a priori information coming from the structure function relationship. Okay, so now I'm using a priori knowledge to figure out whether, what this, whether the data is reliable, right? The divergent data I'm getting is reliable. If it's not reliable, then it's not really in the phenomenon, right? So this issue about reliability turns out to be the linchpin in, in how the theory has to enter into making judgments about what the data is, right? If that's then gonna in turn be used to decide which theory is correct. Um, okay. Um, the presence of order and disorder can also provide useful beforehand information, right? So again, if you have, if you have empirical data about the, all of these protein structures and their sequences, you can use that to shape your model, which is an, it's coming from molecular dynamics. It's a molecular dynamics model, right? But you use this empirical evidence to shape what's go, what that model is gonna predict, right? And um, then you use the predictions to determine which model and tune your models to what they should say. Okay, and so I'm gonna end with the real phenomena are things that are sufficiently stable to afford detection and representation, this joint thing, organism and environment, right? Okay, jointly. Different types of phenomena populate our universe. Proteins exhibit conformational diversity. Some are not diverse, some are diverse. Some have disordered regions, some don't have disordered regions, right? Different degrees of correlation between sequence and structure are going to be true of the phenomenon. And so I have to use all of the tools in this toolbox to decide whether when I detect something, I'm detecting a signal or a noise, right? Call it noise, I mean different things by that. But, and, and in, if I, and those are, that's gonna using top down to determine what I can call data. And then I use my data to test which of the models that are making the predictions is right. What is real structure as a result of the coordination between ab initio and experimental approaches. And in the literature, and I'm not gonna go through it, it's a, it's a constant back and forth thing. It's not like, I hold this up, I hold this up, and then I'm done, right? There's a con-going iterated process for trying to create this coherent agreement between experimental results and theoretical models. Real phenomena are co-constructed jointly from bottom-up data and top-down theories within, and I didn't give this argument here, a philosophical framework. What counts as a cause had plays a big role here, but that's in the rest of the paper. Okay, I'm gonna stop with that. Um, we take a short break and then reconvene for questions. Good idea. We don't have to, but I've never seen an audience that didn't want it. So that didn't, don't be too long. So should I, I should stop sharing, right? Is that right? I think I'm supposed to stop sharing. And people can see the question. All right, well. Oh, yeah. I wasn't on your committee. I didn't read your I wanted to a couple of times. They can walk for Yeah. Yeah. Um, you more than me. I wasn't talking to those people. But anyway, this I came from other sources.
I mean, I've been reading the episode, so I can get you know, know. Right, but it's good. Like, so you're this is in your space of. What is what? Yeah, it's not because I've not been a lot in common in this Fast, right. Yeah, maybe it's I've been working in Right. Right. And I, yes, because he had this, yeah, he's working on this assumption of what they yeah, so say. So I deny them too in the, in the way. He denies them. I replace them with something else. Yeah. And it's not natural classifications. Yeah. Well, I. Okay. I don't know. I, I'm not trying so much to justify a reading of Duam as to use a reading of Duam to do something else. So you, so that I just find him great. I find I mean, every time I read him, I learn something. So I, you know, so. Um, well, let's read the well. Let's have a group because, um, again, you know, and that's always tricky, right? Because I don't want to get into a debate about what do and must have meant and what was going on in, in you know, France in the 19th century and what he was in the early 20th century. I want to read it, but I don't want to do it. <laughs> it's very late what you're saying. I just don't know. Is that the sense? So I use the sense well. Okay. Okay. Sense of insight or strength of the sense of people. Yeah. And the other. Kind of like that. Kind of like that. Yeah, that does it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's kind of what it's called. Cool. Can you email me? Can you email me this? Or if there's more? Okay. Yeah. Right. Right. Have this other prank. Yeah. Okay. This is this is how a pragmatist reads. Which is okay. So I think that I mean yeah. So I think I think that could be, but uh, but you have to embed everything I've said within a frame. So the frame you're giving is a frame, a perspective in which you would do these things. There's other ones. Um, so you already have to have the other fact 